Olá, eu sou Maurício Pontes, gestor de crises, professor da Escola Berge de Comunicação e CEO da C5I, C5I, consultoria em risco e gerenciamento de crises. E tenho o prazer de estar aqui hoje para conversar com Meredith Perfanti, que tem uma reputação que a precede em termos de conhecimento, experiência, em comunicação em situações de crise, especificamente no setor de privacidade, segurança de dados, ataques de cybersecurity. Então, a partir desse momento, eu tenho o prazer de iniciar essa conversa. So, I'm pleased to welcome a Meredith Garfanti. She is Senior Managing Director of FTI Consulting. She co-leads Uh, the Cyber Security and Data Privacy Communications sector. She is responsible for provide counseling to companies suffering cyber attacks and privacy investigations. And Meredith, thank you so much to take this time to share your experience, your knowledge, with Aberge, with the Brazilian Association for Business Communication. It's really a honor and a privilege uh, to be with you and to have this chat. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mauricio. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Likewise. Let me start by wondering about this moment we are living. When we when we speak about future, the future is already happening. So things are very quickly. And uh, we are living a moment, we are still living a moment of the COVID-19. And would you share with us in your perspective uh, what you see as possible trends for crisis management Uh, what to expect, especially considering those events that I have mentioned and the astonishing technological evolution that we are living? It's a great question. I think, you know, just to begin with, during COVID-19, when everyone shifted to working from home, obviously a lot more uh, endpoints on the network, a lot more technology Uh, connections to the network with virtual work environment and people feel comfortable when they're working from home and they might not be as alert as they normally are in an office environment, more likely to click on a suspicious phishing link or an attachment from your IT department and boom, it happens from there, the, the cybersecurity attack or, or incident. The other thing is that um, we know that the bad guys, the attackers or hackers are growing more and more sophisticated. Um, and anytime we see an economic downturn or a recession, much like we did during COVID-19, we see the rise in cybersecurity attacks um, because, you know, it's a very lucrative way to make a living, right? These guys are typically very financially motivated. They want to cause as much disruption as they can uh, to companies, particularly companies with deep pockets for high ransom payments. Um, but also we've seen them cause a significant amount of disruption to smaller companies, private companies that are struggling in you know, this, this kind of uh, political and economic environment, as well as um, you know, small governments, municipalities, healthcare systems, Really, you know, no one is insulated from these types of attacks. Um, so I would say, you know, to the latter part of your question, one of the trends we've seen, particularly coming out of COVID and after some very big cyber news headlines about companies being breached, we're seeing many companies take, one, their investment in cybersecurity uh, very seriously, staffing up hiring talent um, and getting really uh, in order when it comes to their cyber management and their risk management programs. And then two, companies preparing, 
right? They're putting their plans down on paper. They want to know what do we do? What are the roles and responsibilities in the event of one of these incidents? And how do we practice? It's just like a game. You have to practice, practice, practice so that in the re the real incident, you know what to do and you know where you're weak and where you're strong. Yeah. So you you understand that we are changing culture. We are evolving to a new step in this context. Absolutely. I think so. I think that, you know, most companies these days, particularly of you know, small to medium and, and larger enterprises, are uh, hiring, like I said, around cybersecurity. They're putting uh, cybersecurity on the, the agenda at the board meetings. It's very top of mind for executives and C-suites. So you're seeing a real culture shift, I think, within companies prioritizing the issue in ways that they not necessarily have historically. Um, and they're really investing, as I said, in, in training as well for their employees so that, you know, the, the workforce is smart, the workforce is vigilant and cautious when it comes to practicing good hygiene around cybersecurity, making sure that, you know, legitimate uh, links are only clicked on and legitimate attachments are only opened and everyone really needs to do their part in protecting the, the company's network. So I think that culture shift is something that um, is happening for the better, really. So this is a silver lining of this mess. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so as a crisis management, I'm always uh finding myself speaking about culture 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 how do we lead culturally with resilience spectrum i mean safety security uh, privacy uh health everything regarding cyber security the best practices when it comes to culture you mean yeah yes. so I think one of the things that's so important about culture, especially the culture of a company and an organization, is the way that you take care of your own employees, right? Um, and oftentimes in these big cyber incidents, there's a lot of distractions, meaning you have the news headlines, you have questions from customers, you have um, you know regulators knocking at the door who want more information. So there's a lot of competing priorities, and sometimes the, the employees are forgotten about as a, as a very key stakeholder group, but the employees of the company are the ones on the front lines who have to answer the phones and take calls from customers. They have to go home and sit around the dinner table with their friends and their family um, when their company might be on the front page of, a, of the newspaper, right? So... Uh, one thing I always stress in times of crisis is make sure that you're treating your employees as your best brand ambassadors, meaning how do you equip them with the right messages, the right talking points, the right questions and answers so that they're equipped to um, not only defend the company, but also to engage in those conversations and not just stick their heads in the sand and say, we can't talk about it. We don't know what's going on. No one's told us anything. Um, so it's really important that I think the company set the right tone culturally with its employee base first. After a cybersecurity incident, I also think um, how you rebuild sort of your story around prioritizing cybersecurity is important because there's this concept that cybersecurity is just IT's job. Right, it's a IT. You'll take care of it. Cybersecurity. I'm I'm in sales, so not my problem. Well, it's really everyone's problem. You know, it's it's something everyone needs to be super mindful of. And again, if it happens to your company, everyone's going to have to play a part in communicating. Uh, so I do think it's it's very important to bear that in mind. Um, we've seen companies take actions like tying uh, compensation and incentive plans to cybersecurity goals as an organization, meaning 
if the organization or the individual doesn't hit their goal past their training, uh, their cybersecurity awareness training, something like that, there's a dock in or a reduction in the uh, compensation plan or the bonus pool. So things like that are people are getting quite creative about how they really embed cybersecurity into the culture, into the compliance. Um, and I do think that's, a, that's an encouraging step because it makes everyone hyper aware of what they're doing and, and being more mindful of it. Yeah, and it applies to ordinary life as well, of course. Absolutely. Well, uh, you have seen and actually uh, you have a lot of experience in big crises. We know they are never the same. Uh, they are always different in some sense. I would like to hear from you. How should an organization react facing a crisis? And uh, how do they actually react? What's the reality? You make a great point. There's always a difference in what should be done in that reality, right? So what goes well and what, what do we tend to see be the most common mistakes? Um, in particular, cybersecurity incidents are very different types of crises because very rarely when the, new, the incident breaks or hits the press or becomes public, do you have a full understanding of how the incident happened, how the attackers got in, what the what the cause of the incident was, and what was actually stolen. Um, because these bad guys get into the network, they tend to traverse the network, get their hands on all sorts of different types of documents, both structured data and unstructured data, um, and they exfiltrate it out of the network. They steal it for, for a more simpler way of, of putting it. And then they hold the data and they use it as extortion means and they hold it for ransom. So pay me or I'll, or I'll leak your data publicly um, or pay me and, and I'll give it back to you. Extortion in that sense. Um, what we tell companies is, you know, be the driver of your own message. Be truthful. Be as transparent as you possibly can but be accurate. You don't want to say anything that um, ends up not being true two days from now, because if you have to say, oh, remember what I told you two days ago? Oh, it's no longer true. People feel like you're not in control of the investigation um, and you don't really know what's happening and, and you're, you're all over the place. And that's what we don't want. So sometimes it's better to say, here's what we know to be a, a fact today. We just don't know the answer to everything right now. As we learn more, we're going to share more. But we've hired the best experts in the in the cybersecurity business to come advise us. We're working with law enforcement and the regulators. We are going to abide by you know the data protection laws and take the counsel of of law enforcement and how we handle these bad guys. And by the way, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that. However, these bad guys got in, we're going to close that up and do our best to make sure it doesn't happen again. That is a better answer than saying, uh, here's how they got in. Here's everything they took. It was actually nothing. We're all done here because forensic investigations, they just take time. They're complicated. Um, you know, they're very technical and they change hour by hour. So until you really, really know what happened Try not to speculate or, or get drawn into um, a guessing game because that's sort of the downfall. So I think that's probably the most common mistake. Um, and then the, the other thing we said, I already mentioned, forgetting about employees as a key stakeholder group. Uh, that's a bit a pretty common mistake that employees are sort of an afterthought when really they need to be finding about out about this from you versus from from the company itself versus from the media. Same with customers. They don't want to wake up and hear that their biggest you know, vendor or, or MSP or technology provider uh, is on the front page of a paper. They want a phone call from you saying something bad happened. We're on it. We're going to fix it. We'll keep you updated. So those are the kind of things that we're thinking about 
um, in terms of responding to the crisis? How do we put the company in the driver's seat and make them look as prepared as possible? Um, which leads me, I could talk about this all day, clearly, leads me to my last point. Um, another common pitfall we see is companies just don't have a plan. They have no plan in place, and they're trying to create a plan in the middle of the fire, right? And that's very hard to do. It's very hard to establish decision makers and rules and responsibilities while you're trying to put out all these fires because um, in a cyber incident, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. You've got lawyers, you've got communicators, you've got IT people, you've got information security, external, you know, uh, ransom threat intelligence experts. So just a lot of people to work with and everyone has to know how to collaborate, who's in charge of making decisions and how information is shared. So it's really important to have that plan down on paper before an incident happens. Yes, yes, I totally, I totally agree. Better safe than sorry. That's what they teach us from the very beginning. Uh, nevertheless, crisis happens. You you just said we do the best possible, but uh, that's the uncertainty and certain things are out of control. So how to mitigate the effects of a typical cybersecurity crisis based on your personal experience? Well, I think you made a great point, Mauricio, is no matter how hard we try and, and practice and prepare, these things are just bound to happen. In, in particular with cyber, you know, the, the good guys have to be right 100% of the time, and the bad guys just have to be right once, right, to, to cause chaos. So it's one of those things where they're getting more and more sophisticated and smarter and smarter, and so are we, but it just takes one time. And, and that really goes for any type of crisis, be it a natural disaster. You know, a, a, I know you don't have hurricanes in Brazil, but, a, you know, another uh, thing that you just can't prevent. So the way that the company responds um, is so important to pre preserving their long term reputation. And and I think one of the, the best um, pieces of counsel I would give is you know, map out those stakeholder groups ahead of time. If you are a B2C type of company, um, direct to consumer type of company, what are your channels for communicating? How do you reach your customer base? What happens if you're dealing with something like a cybersecurity incident where all of a sudden your company no longer has access to your corporate email? What are your backup plans? Um, and how do you reach how do you reach people? We see this happen all the time where corporate email is just completely shut off. So being really smart about having redundancies in your plan around business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, so, so important. That and also thinking about consistency in message. A lot of times there's a temptation to say one thing to one audience but then maybe a little bit more to a different audience, right? If it's your key customer, um, maybe you just want to reassure them that none of their data was taken. And then of course, you know, investigation could change and that might not be true. So it's just, it's really important to establish what the message is, keep it consistent across all of the different groups. If, it, if that's a regulator, a customer, or a um, a partner, a, an industry association, um, and being communicative. Like you want to interact with them. You want to provide them with updates. You want to evolve the story as you, as the crisis progresses. Um, and you want to talk about what you're doing uh, to keep business up and running, to keep serving your, your customer base, whether that's B2B or B2C. Um, focus on those things. Uh, and I think in any type of crisis, that really applies is, well, what are you doing to fix it? How did you get here? What are you doing to fix it? And, and what are the steps you're taking to ensure that, you know, in the long run, you're as best protected as possible to make sure it doesn't happen again? No one can ever promise it's not going to happen again, but at least you can learn from, you know, what you've been through and share best practices with 
peers or with your, you know, your team and, and everyone can grow and learn from it. It's, it's like finding the, the silver lining in the crisis. How did hacking have been developing in the last few years? Mm, great question. Uh, it's gotten a lot more creative, I'll tell you that. But the, the bad guys, as I, I've said, uh, we call them in, in the cyber world threat actors um, or the attackers, the hackers. They have uh, evolved from, I'll take ransomware, for example, which is a hot topic these days. It used to be that the hackers would get in and they would just cause disruption by encrypting systems, right? So you walk in one day, you go to log into your computer and you can't do it. There's a ransom note that says you've been hacked or, or whatever. And then, you know, everyone couldn't work and it was tough and it was very disruptive, but eventually it got fixed and life, life moved on. Now, or you paid the ransom, which, you know, not many companies do, uh, hopefully, but you know, it, it happens. Uh, oh, now what the bad guys are doing is they're doing the encryption. They're pressuring you to pay for a tool to de to unlock the systems, but they're also stealing data. I mentioned that before. So they're looking for sensitive personal information or financial data about the company, um, trade secrets, intellectual property, things that are valuable that the company would pay for uh, to get back. So they're extorting uh, the company is now in two, di two different ways. We call it double extortion with the uh, encryption and then also the data theft. Um, there's something called triple extortion now where on top of both of those things, the bad guys, if the company is not uh, coming to the negotiating table, the bad guys will threaten to call the press and tell them about the attack or they'll start spam emailing all of the employees of the company with really nasty emails, or they will call executives and their family members, threatening them. Um, they've gotten very creative and very good at what they do. DDoS attacks is another pre uh, another pressure tactic, distributed denial of service in, uh, attacks. Um, I even had one case, a little war story for you. I was working for a large hospital system and the the attackers compromised the printers in the hospital so the hospital wasn't negotiating and then all of the floors of the hospital the the printers were compromised and they were shooting out ransom notes from the printers so literally employees were running around the hospitals having to unplug the printers to get them to stop um so it's wild it's very crazy stuff that they're doing these days it's really evolved uh, and the, the the bad guys are getting smarter and smarter. So we have to stay one step ahead. That's scary. But uh, as you just said, it's a moment of changing culture and be uh, prepared in advance, of course. Exactly. What's your opinion about certain tools and expertise like counterintelligence, or intelligence, corporative intelligence for this type of crisis? I think it's uh, intelligence is a very important part of uh, how you defend against and how you uh, pr uh, prepare for cybersecurity incidents, but also how you respond to them as well. Um, the, the threat intelligence that we have today from you know, experts in the field, from law enforcement, from government agencies that are dedicated to cyber incidents. Uh, in the United States, we have the CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, I know in the UK, there's the NCSC, the National Cybersecurity Center, um, and the NCA. They're all uh, great at sharing information on things like critical vulnerabilities that need to be patched or various uh, threat actor activity that is targeting specific industries or sectors like critical infrastructure or healthcare in particular, financial services is another big one. Um, but all of that threat intelligence sharing has become super crucial to, to really preparing for and closing up any gaps that may exist in uh, the network. 
Um, and then also, you know, when, and it's very common, at least in, in the United States, to collaborate with law enforcement when you're responding to one of these types of incidents, because they have certain divisions that are dedicated to different threat actor groups. Like there's two threat actor groups that come to mind right now. Lockbit is a big one that's hit a bunch of companies. Hive is another big one. So you have different divisions of the FBI that are essentially dedicated to those groups. So they have information um, on things like, you know, malicious IP addresses to block, um, things like that that are helpful to the security community uh, in being on the lookout for these types of incidents. So we always encourage that type of public, private sector, um, threat intelligence sharing. There's groups like, you know, the Financial Services Information Analysis Center, the FSI SAC, which is like a trade organ, a trade group that shares threat intelligence. So it's great when I think a, a rising tide lift, lifts all boats mentality. Everyone helps each other in the, sec the security community. Um, I hear all the time, like security is a team sport, right? You have to be helping each other so that everyone gets stronger and better together. What do you think is the worst case scenario generally and for a company? Because the world today depends on technology. Would be a chaos if something really huge mm -hmm. uh, could affect our capability of communicating, navigating, and um, you name it. Mm -hmm. So what is the worst case scenario, Meredith? So I, I have two answers to the question, a little bit different perspectives, but I think from a economic and safety point of view, the cyber incidents that impact critical infrastructure, things like, you know, our roadways, our airways, our, um, you know, our gasoline supply, our emergency services, uh, energy, you know, the utilities, those are water supply. Um, those are the ones that really scare me, um, particularly because they put people's lives in jeopardy. And it's, it's hard to think about, you know, these bad guys that are typically um, out for financial gain, monetary gain, could cause that kind of chaos and disruption. Um, and it's a slippery slope, right, to actual cyber warfare. Um, and, I, and I do find that to be, you know, something that keeps me up at night. Um, I hope, you know, we do, do not see that. A lot of the financial organizations after in incidents that have impacted um, and a lot of the threat actors that are out for making money, they've kind of said after the Colonial Pipeline case in the U.S., which affected the gas supply, um, we've seen that, you know, the NHS impacted in the UK with emergency services. We saw a case where the water supply in the state of Florida and the U.S. was um, nearly poisoned by a bad guy. Uh, we see the attackers now say, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to be really careful. We're only out to make money. But, you know, sometimes they just don't know what they're doing. So all of that really, really terrifies me. Um, the second scenario that I think is absolute worst case and I've seen play out is when a cyber incident puts a company out of business because the disruption to the operations are so significant that the company has to rebuild systems and infrastructure from scratch. And all of their customer base just says, well, we can't be down for a month or two months while you rebuild your systems, you should have had a backup plan. So we're going to go to your competitor. Oh, and by the way, they're they're hemorrhaging money, right? And the resources that they have to spend on rebuilding the infrastructure, hiring, you know, bankruptcy lawyers or, or cyber lawyers, uh, communications counsel, forensics, uh, they may or may not have cyber insurance, um, you know, and, and we've seen companies just go right out of business because of it. And it is truly, um, you know, the worst day of their lives. We've seen executives, um, you know, break down in tears on calls because they know it's it's something that they 
should have thought about ahead of time. And unfortunately, it's it's just something that they could not overcome, no matter how great their response was, just because of the damage to um, the operations, the business continuity, and their customer base. So, um, you know, we try to do everything we can help with them preserving their reputations in those cases, but it is a, a real consequence of these types of incidents and not being prepared for them. You are a journalist. Communicating such a technical issue and um, it's a big challenge, is it? It's a really complicated subject to learn. Uh, obviously, I'm super passionate about it. And I have had some very great mentors um, along the way in my career who have taught me so much about cybersecurity. Um, I actually, I worked in-house for six years at a company called Equifax in uh Brazil, they have a joint venture with Boa Vista. I think you yeah. um, might, might be familiar, but they had a cybersecurity incident in uh, 2017. That was a very publicized incident. And I was uh, in charge of crisis communications at the time. So learned a lot about cyber on the fly. Um, but after the incident, the company brought in a new head of information security, a new chief security officer. And I can remember sitting in his office every day uh, while he would draw out for me how a firewall worked and what network segmentation meant and the way that malware could be deployed. Um, so he really invested in, in teaching me some of those things because he understood that the partnership between communications and technology was so important in the event we ever needed to you know, respond plus in terms of rebuilding trust with our customers. And we had to explain to them, you know, what we were doing to um, move the company forward to mature the cybersecurity program. And I really, you know, had a passion for it and wanted to learn it. And I'm, I'll always be grateful um, to him for teaching me a lot about it. And then likewise, you know, in my career now, um, I work alongside some very fantastic um, cyber attorneys, one of my my favorite cyber attorneys to work with. Uh, I I learn so much from every day. He spends time to, you know, teach me about investigations and where to kind of poke further so that we're asking the right questions that a customer would be asking or a regulator would be asking. And so that we're really helping the customer, uh, our client, uh, get ready to respond to those things. So two great mentors in my my career. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that uh, cybersecurity is constantly evolving. And I learn something new every day from every case we work on. Um, so it's exciting. I love my job. That's very important. And you say you this passion and uh, usually say that people who uh, choose this uh, way of living must be very passionate. And uh, before we close this this wonderful moment, I would like to to ask you if you have something you would like to say to Brazilians, to Aberge associates. It's your first time in Brazil, you told me. Please feel free, uh, take this time to, to say whatever you want. Sure. Well, first of all, um, Mauricio and Albert and your viewers, thank you so much for having me. Um, truly, the pleasure and the, the honor is mine. You have a, um, a wonderful culture here in Brazil, beautiful country. I'm so excited to see more of it, to spend the entire week here, to learn more about the market trends and what you're seeing from your perspective in terms of data security and privacy and uh, I will be fortunate enough to, to eat some good food and, and enjoy along the way. Um, so, so very happy with my time here so far. Um, and then in terms of just parting words and, and advice, I would say the one thing I would impress upon you is, um, you know, the this threat will continue to persist. I think that it's one that's becoming more and more common in, in Brazil. You have a great economy here, a lot of big businesses that are headquartered here. Um, so I would just encourage your viewers to be thinking about their plans, right? You know, hopefully you will never have to take those plans off the shelf. But as you said, 
better to be safe than sorry. Think through, you know, how you would respond to one of these incidents. Practice. Um, you know, we have a great team at FTI here in uh, Sao Paulo and in Rio. And um, I know that this is something they're helping their clients through here, you know, is practicing these plans, um, war gaming a little bit, tabletop exercising, developing preparedness protocols. And um, uh, that's just something I would really encourage uh, your viewers to to get on before before it's too late. So nice. again, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our chat, um, and I wish uh, I wish you all the best, and hope we can speak again.